Welcome back to the class Machine Translation. Today we're going to take a closer look at words and morphology after all we learned about how neural machine translation systems are built. Now we can actually revisit the issue of how to represent words in these models. So just as an overview to make it plain and simple what wor role words play in language, here's a naive view of language. So language needs to name things uh, and uses nouns, objects in the world, like dog. It needs to name actions. So for that, it, use, it uses verbs, like jump. And then also, it needs to name properties of objects and actions, like brown and quickly. So there also have to be the relationship between these words uh, more clearly specified. So that can be done either by word order, which, for instance, English is doing very heavily, or it can be done by morphology and function words. So function words are then additional types of words. Their only role is functional in a specifying relationship between the other words in a sentence. Morphology is a way to add or modify words, add letters to a word or modify words in other ways um, to indicate the role. So here's an example from Latin, which heavily draws on morphology instead of word order. Theoretically, you can actually throw those words into the sentence in any way you want. And some poets are taking uh, advantage of that. So here's the uh, one sentence in a poem by Catullus. Uh, so, cui dono lepidum novum libellum arida modo pumisi eploititum. And uh, so you see all the words here relatively cleanly and if it, that ends with um, they're all related to each other. So it's, it's a, a lovely new little book that is also polished. So this relative clause that is this part of the sentence also relates to it, and that's indicated by the verb being here now turned into uh, yeah, something like an adjective that is also inflected the same way. So we also have to mark the relationship of noun phrases to the verb, and one way you can do this is case. So Let's think about a sentence where we want to talk about some giving action. There's an apple involved and a man and a woman. So if I just say there's a giving action, there's an apple involved and a man and a woman, I'm basically naming all the content words of the sentence, but you actually don't know exactly who is giving what to whom. So here in German is an example how this can be done by uh, verb inflect, uh, noun inflection. So the verb here is gibt, gives, and uh, that already gives something away that the subject is singular, but in our, our examples, all these things are singular. But um, then you could say the woman gives the man the apple. That's how you would do it in English. So that clarifies by word order what the relationship is. Um, in German, if you look closely here, especially you see it clearly here in the, ad, in the determiners, uh, these are all forms. These are all the forms of the word the, but they indicate the case. Okay. Um, another thing that's happening with words is uh, compounding. So the definition of word boundaries is actually purely an artifact of the writing system and spoken language. We don't make pauses between words, although it sounds like it. I think the best example for that why that is the case. Uh, or they'll convince yourself that's the case, just listen to some foreign speech. So when ich jetzt irgendwas in Deutsch sage, dann ist dir nicht ganz klar, was die Wörter sind. So if I say something in German, as I just did, I don't think you could have counted the words. Okay. Um, differences between languages are uh, some do a lot of compounding. So German actually does a lot of compounding. So if you now talk about this as a computer science seminar, or computer science lecture. Uh, that's how you would write it in English. And this is how you write it in German. German has a bit different word for computer science, informatics. But then 
seminar is just attached to it. There's also somewhat a loose kind of transient relationship between what function words are and what affixes are. Um, so here's some border cases. So Joe, um, is that an affix? Is that a separate word? So um, we typically separate that out in, in pre-processing. So then it makes it two separate words. Otherwise, it's an affix. OK, um, the, uh, the way affixes attach to words also is not as simple as we might want to have it as computer scientists. So it's not like plurals are may form by adding the word s. Yes, that happens, as in dogs. But then in ponies, actually, there are some additional changes that happen. And think about what nouns that end in s, and you take the plural of it. That gets even messier. OK, uh, another one is the, the, uh, the, the function word a that actually changes when the noun that follows begins with a vowel. Um, interestingly, it's not the letter doesn't have to be a vowel. It's just the pronunciation has to be an hour. vowel. A good example for that is an hour where, yeah, it starts with an h, but that h is not really pronounced. OK. Um, so words have a part of speech. So this is the very first thing we said, the nouns, verbs, and adjectives. But actually, you can turn nouns into verbs, and verbs into adjectives, and adjectives into anything. So um, here's uh, one example. Um, so if you take the noun nation, you can make it an adjective, national. You can make it an adverb, nationally. nationally. Um, you can also make it another noun, nationalist. Um, that turns it into a proponent for a nation. Um, and then you have nationalism, which is uh, the ideology that your nation is better than anybody else's. Uh, there's nationalize, which means something completely different, which basically turn over the ownership of a company to the, comp to the country, and so on and so on. So these are all kind of, very, it's a very creative process of uh, creating additional words. And sometimes this changes uh, the part of speech. So we have nouns here, uh, but we also have verbs, adverbs, adjective, all formed from the same base word. So the distinction between part of speech is quite fluid. Uh, so if I want to say a sentence like, I want to integrate morphology, and I want the integration of morphology, they almost sound the same. There's very little difference. Um, but there's really a fundamental difference from a syntactic point of view that this is a subject and here that's a noun. So this is a whole different uh, uh, syntactic construction, although it's really not that different on a just purely surface level. OK, there are also meaning altering affixes. So English, for instance, un reverses an, like un, well, negates an action, undo, redo, repeats an action. Hyper is also a somewhat uh, productive uh, prefix that you can put in on a lot of other stuff. Um, I, I have a really nice example I like a lot. In German, there's the, the sehr as a prefix. If you put that in front of a, an, a verb, it implies that the verb also causes some kind of dis destruction. And that can be used in very, very creative ways. So for instance here, das Thema. So if without the said, which just means he talks about the topic, but it said means he talks about the topic so much that the topic is just completely uh, obliterated and nobody wants to talk about it anymore. Um, uh, so here another example that uh, you will come across here if you live in the United States is ito that makes objects small. So whenever you wonder why burrito is called burrito, it's actually a small burro. So a, a small um, cow or steer. Okay. So morphology also allows adding more subtle meaning. So uh, verb tenses, um, that's not necessarily super subtle, but uh, you need to talk about actions. It might be important to also in, uh, say when did the action happen. And you can actually do this with verb tenses. So if you say something about he gave an apple, he gives an apple, he will give an apple, um, that's all impressed, 
all expressed either by morphology or additional function words. And then just adds information about timing without explicitly saying in the future or in the past. Um, another one is count, if something is singular or plural. Um, definiteness is something really subtle. Um, the cat versus a cat, so it clarifies for instance, if the relationship to previously mentioned objects, or if you just talk about generic instance of a category and so on. Um, there's grammatical gender, which has very little to do with uh, natural gender, but it does help th with things like co-reference and other disambiguation challenges. So some of this information is redundant. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. A language tends to be somewhat redundant, but keep in mind that language is also a means of communication and maybe some things get misheard or not fully understood. So repeating information many times actually is a good thing. Okay, after this quick crash course on morphology, let's think about how morphology impacts machine translation. So one very glaring example is if you just look at how many unknown words there are in a test set, that is driven a lot by morphology. So this is a standardized test set where the same sentences were translated across many sentences, uh, languages, and the training data is also somewhat similar. It's not perfect. Uh, but you do see um, that uh, English, so there's now looking at the source language, so English only uh, half a percent of the words are actually unknown. 99.5% of all the tokens have been seen before. Well, that is not the case for Russian. So Russian is a definitely much more inflected language than any of these here. Um, so there's also this problem of differently encoded information. Um, so we said that morphologies, one of the key features of morphology is to clarify the relationship of words to each other in a sentence. Well, this could also be done by word order. So if you translate from a language that converts, uh, that is uh, using mostly inflections into a language that is called configurational, uh, so it mostly operates by word order to clarify the relationship of the entities in a sentence then uh, this actually becomes a problem. So this is a very short sentence. Das behaupten Sie wenigstens, where das could mean this or the claim. This means claim as a verb. Um, this means they or she. It's actually super ambiguous. Uh, and that means at least. So that has to be either be put in the front or the back, but the kind of big issue is like, what's going on here? And uh, just kind of, from morphology, you can actually see that this is a plural verb and therefore um, this has to be the subject. That's the only subject that fits here. And this is something that a native speaker of German would do completely uh, intuitively without even thinking about it and would even have a hard time explaining what, why they, they could figure that out. Okay. Um, there's also non-local information sometimes needed to get the right morphology. So now we're talking more about issues like when you translate something into a language that is morphologically richer, maybe that morphological information is just very strangely implicit in the source language or even has to be hallucinated. Here's an example of uh, pronoun translation. So just the translating the word it into languages that are gendered is actually a huge problem because you have to figure out what they refer to. So you basically have to do this reasoning that it refers to movie. Movie is going to be translated as film. And film is masculine. Therefore, it is also mass it has to be translated into a masculine pronoun, where in German that would be er, er. So we're actually not handling this very well, especially this, this is also a problem that could span sentence boundaries. So this is one of the main motivations of going beyond sentence boundaries and machine translation. Okay, um, ultimately there is some complex semantic inference that might happen. Um, so here's an example of how do you translate a word like cousin that in 
English is not gender marked, but in German is gender marked and has to be gender marked. There is no gender neutral word for cousin in German. And uh, you kind of have to go through this whole inference chains that the uncle has daughters. So these are my cousins since their daughters, they're female. So therefore the cousin is also female. Okay. Let's see what we can do about, uh, so morphology mostly poses a problem for machine translation because it blows up the size of the vocabulary. And then maybe multiple pieces of information are encoded in one word in one language while they're encoded in multiple words in the other language. So what could we do about this? So one pre-processing scheme is to just split things up into morphemes. So um, if you translate from German to English here, you could, in this example, line up the sentences pretty well. Er wohnt in einem großen Haus. He lives in a big house. Um, and you kind of see when you translate from German to English, there's a lot of completely pointless morphology that really doesn't add anything. Um, so this is the inflection of the determiner and the adjective for the noun that doesn't exist in English. And um, here you have the inflection of uh, um, wohnen as the verb that's inflected for as in English, third person singular, which in English is also third person singular. So you actually want to keep that stuff here around. So this here is useful morphology and this is kind of useless morphology. So one idea would be to reduce um, German morphology to match the English. So you could just replace a sentence like this here. Um, so this is a technique that has been especially applied to highly inflected languages. Um, one of the classic examples is Turkish, other big ones are Finnish, but also Arabic has seen a lot of word here. So uh, I'm not going to even try to pronounce this because I don't know how to speak if, uh, Turkish, but apparently what's going on here is there's some words here um, in, um, in Finnish, uh, in Turkish that have all kinds of inflectional information that are expressed in English with function words. So you see there are um, five Turkish words and the words in bold in English kind of correspond to them. So this is the first one. Um, this is the second one. So they are kind of correspond pretty nicely. They're not actually morphologically super complex, but hey, what's going on there? There's all this additional stuff here in English. Where does that come from? And it's somewhat important to generate that. So you somehow have to map the Turkish morphology to English function words. So how do you do that? So again, we can use the same kind of philosophy of saying, um, let's do morphological analysis, split up words into morphemes, then figure out which warm themes actually matter. So this lar morpheme here seems to imply plural, where there's other morphological information that's less interesting. This morpheme here, na, seems to uh, translate then or generate the word off and so on. So this is a standard technique uh, to split language up into morphology and then process it from there. Okay, here's a, a scheme for Arabic that also has been very much studied. It was a big topic for machine translation research in the United States for quite a while. Um, and uh, uh, here's kind of the, uh, the way words are formed in Arabic. So there's a base word that actually, word that actually uh, matters. This might be uh, al means might be a definite pronoun the definite determiner, which you may or may not have. And then you have uh, uh, pronomial morphemes like there. So they apple would be one word. And then you have some, some additional particles. So to the, to his apple or for his apple. Okay. And then there's some additional ones like and actually becomes a prefix. So that's pretty irritating as well. So all this is probably best split up somehow. So we have the same basic strategy as we have for German and English, where we say, um, let's separate them out as tokens and keep the ones that matter. Um, and maybe even keep some attached to the words and others just drop them. 
um, here's a famous scheme called MADA that was proposed for Arabic that did all this uh, pre-processing and, uh, and removed uh, some of the uh, morphemes at certain points in times. Um, this looks a bit odd to you. Um, uh, this is Arabic written in a certain way in English, in Latin, in actually Latin script. Oh. So it's called a certain Romanization scheme. So this is one that completely preserves a one-to-one -one mapping to the original uh, Arabic characters, but obviously it becomes a bit unreadable. So I don't know even how to pronounce this here. It starts, tries to be somewhat readable, but it doesn't. It's not fully vested to be readable. Okay, so here are various schemes how to split that up. Okay, um, another idea is uh, factored models. So that was a big thing in statistical MT, but you can also have a version of it. Neural machine translation has been also been applied to neural machine translation. So it's basically saying let's encode words in factored representations. So have uh, one encoding for the word stem, for the words, the full word, so maybe that goes over the entire vocabulary, but then also a more decomposed uh, representations where we have the lemma, so the base form of the verb, uh, it's part of speech, morphology, word class, all kinds of additional information paired with the word. So you have a richer representation of the words. Okay, um, let's move to uh, the neural world of things. So uh, word embeddings. So we already talked about word embeddings. Um, so what that gives us somehow in the training of a model, the first mapping of a one hot vector to uh, a continuous space representation gives you these word embeddings, which have all these nice properties that words that have similar meaning, get similar representation, passing and running, or have very, very similar representation and so on. So, um, so the word embedding is actually not a new idea, and it's not something that just was came and was invented with um, neural neural models applied to natural language processing. So this is there's a long-standing idea of latent semantic analysis of representing words based on their context. Um, so this is kind of the the key idea here that a word occurs in a particular context and words that occur in similar context have similar meanings. So for instance, the word dog occurs, you know, the word cute might be in front of it, fluffy might be around somewhere, dangerous, not a little bit, not so much. And then of course, there's also a huge tail of function words are all over the place. And then you look at the word cat and the cats are also often cute, described as cute and fluffy and not very much dangerous. While the words like lion, are not that often described as cute and fluffy, but more often as dangerous. Um, so you have to be careful here a little bit with this large count of function words. Um, so sometimes they even completely filtered out. Uh, this is then called stop word removal. But you can then build vectors based on that and compare words based on that. So here's a little bit the math on that. Uh, there's something called pointwise mutual information you could compute just basically looks at the joint probability and divided by the probability of the individual words. How often do these words occur together? That's measured here. And then how much do these words occur just by themselves? Um, and uh, the more words occur together, other than you would expect when they're independent of each other, which is you're ultimately computing here. So, um, then uh, there seems to be some correlation between them. And you're probably gonna get that for things like cute and cat, uh, uh, cute, and do uh, cute and dog and cute and cat, but you're not gonna get it for cute and lion. Uh, words like off, this kind of then falls off because off kind of more randomly occurs in the context of these words. Okay. Um, so singular value decomposition is another me method in the spirit. So we look at the raw core current statistics. So that gives us a very, very sparse matrix. So there's often the idea that, well, this raw statistic over all these word core occurrences is maybe too sparse. Maybe you should reduce it into a lower dimensional matrix. So here's the idea. You factorize uh, 
uh, the pointwise mutual information matrix that we kind of described on the previous slide into two orthogonal matrices U and V and uh, then have a di diagonal matrix uh, sigma here. So what does that do? So here's kind of the idea. Um, you take, this is the big matrix that has a lot of empty space in it. And uh, then you convert it into something like this here and something like this here. Um, and then uh, you, you basically have uh, a mapping here in the middle. Um, but the idea is then, of course, is to, to, to do this with, uh, to do a smaller kind of uh, mapping here in the middle. And uh, you do this by kind of removing um, some of the rows and columns. So basically, since we're multiplying here with really, really small values, this kind of gets removed anyway. So we just kind of completely cut this out and stick with this matrix. Okay, I'm not going here in the details how to compute this. Um, the book actually has some details on that. Okay, um, so how did we get word embeddings? So we came up with uh, originally things like continuous bag of words. These were the first kind of neural metal models we also introduced. A variant of that is the skip gram model. And uh, um, there are also other ideas. Um, so here's an idea that kind of draws on these core current statistics. So this is a method called GLOVE. That was quite influential for a while and the leading method and outperforming the previous ones. So this basically starts with these core current statistics. So it actually still collected these core current statistics. And then the idea is, can we predict the values in this matrix um, by basically coming up with good target word embeddings and context word embeddings. So we have to have we have to embed these words and these words and you might use different embeddings for them and uh, then uh, can we uh, basically predict the actual true co-occurrence matrix here. So this actually then becomes a training setup where you have to learn the embeddings that once you kind of multiply uh, these two vectors together with uh, um, that product um, gives you a number that can be then compared against the number in the table here. Okay, uh, there's a bunch of refinements. Uh, you can have bias terms for both B and for both the context word and the target word. There's also the problem that most of the word pairs are completely meaningless. So, you know, does the core current statistics of stenographer and uh, chicken really mean anything? Probably not. It's probably zero anyway. So uh, we probably don't need that as much. So one idea is to discount uh, word pairs uh, that uh, are just rare. So this is just looks at the actual number in the core current statistics. And if it gets too small, um, it becomes less of a cost up here. So here's now the complete refined cost function to do this uh, optimization to run word embeddings based on this big core occurrence statistics matrix. Okay. Um, we moved on in the field, or I mean, the, the methods I talked to so far is learning word embeddings, which is a valuable goal, but to actually do natural language processing um, knowing words occur in different contexts and have different meanings in different contexts probably is going to do you better. So that triggered a whole wave of having contextualized word embeddings. So the idea was let's look at the words in context and have embeddings from language models. That's what ELMO means. Um, this started a whole Sesame Street craze in the field. So. Elmo is also a character in the Sesame Street. So embedding some language models. This should now come to you as not a total startling surprise because that's what we have been doing. That was our encoder in that you know, machine translation was, yes, we first do contextualized word embeddings by running recurrent neural networks, even left and right. 
and even have several layers. And this is basically this just to have basically this encoder idea was picked up by uh, then researchers in broader natural language community and uh, uh, used for uh, basically has been used since then for many many applications to figure out um, yeah how to use representation of words for many many tasks. Um, there's some interesting observation that in the early layers more syntactic information is encoded while in later layers more semantic information is encoded. So as machine translation has moved from uh, recurrent neural networks to the transformer models, so have uh, the people who are interested in multilingual and in word embeddings um, also moved to the transformer models. Um, so there is a famous model called BERT that has been just been modified and varied in various ways in the recent years this is a pretty pretty active field um, it's actually trained a little bit differently so the pre the elmo model was really trained as a language model this one here we're gonna train in different ways there are uh, different several training strategies and there are also new training strategies being explored so one training strategy is to say let's just make a mapping task where you have to fill in gaps in a sentence so this is the sentence context and you have to fill in these words so why is this better than a left to right language model well because it doesn't have the bias from a left to right language model that only the left context matters here now we also look at the right context so there's an entire sentence available to us so you can then predict words out of context so brown is probably mostly informed by fox that's probably the more useful thing also the general context here that it has to be an adjective is probably also useful. Uh, another task is next sentence prediction. That's obviously a really hard task. So if your first sentence is all families, all happy families are alike, how likely are you going to predict each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way as the next sentence? So maybe if you read Tolstoy, you know that. But uh, otherwise, the machine uh, has really very little clue. However, uh, words like unhappy, given that we just had happy, are probably more likely that we kind of repeat the word family here, albeit in a different morphological variant, is also uh, similar. Also, this is kind of a statement that's also on the next sentence. So there's a lot of similarities, and basically uh, a model that represents words has to be able to make use of these similarities. Okay, um, there's an uh, uh, even bigger version of BERT, to put it very loosely, called GPT-3 that came out this year uh, that made a lot of waves. Uh, but it's basically the same thing. It's a, it's a transformer model trained at just like BERT. It's just massive. It has 175 billion parameters. What does that mean? Well, it means it's a transformer model with 96 layers where uh, the representations that are used have uh, 12,288 dimensions, so not the usual 500 or 1,000 that we have encountered. Also, the attention mechanism has 96 attention heads. Uh, this is also trained on massive amounts of data, 500 billion word data set, um, a lot of web crawl data, but then also some more higher quality data that are oversampled. Interestingly, it didn't even manage to train on all the data, so it's less than one epoch over this entire training corpus. Um, there's some computational statistics here that are somewhat mind-boggling. So they said this took 3,640 petaflop per second days. Uh, and they, used, they even specified which hardware they used, so I looked that up. So this one has about 0.1 petaflops. That means you need to have, uh, so it basically is about 36,000 compute days on these things. Um, so if I hope you're not going to run out and try to do this yourself, because if you price this out at Amazon, it's going to cost you about somewhere between half a million and a million dollars. So this was kind of a massive undertaking and uh, also somewhat ridiculed for just being just brute force. However, um, the better the models, the more we train, the bigger you have that, the better performance you get. So bigger is better. 
And as long as that is the case, there is definitely an incentive to train these massive amounts of models on pretty much yeah, close to all English text ever written. And um, it gives you interesting, better performance across many, many language tasks, such as question answering, sentiment detection, and so on. Okay, uh, let's move on to multilingual word embeddings, which is definitely closer at our heart here. So, um, so word embeddings are often viewed as semantic representations of words. So it's tempting then to see embedding spaces as language independent. So if they are semantic representations, well, people talk about similar things, have similar concepts. Cats exist in English language, Spanish language, German language. So they should be mapped to the same vector. Well, maybe that's too much to ask. But the relationship between words should be similar. So, but maybe we should actually train a multilingual word embedding space where uh, words that have to just differ by kind of the language they come from, but they actually have the same meaning, have the same representation. So here's uh, uh, one of these early arguments that I made uh, here. So there's a bunch of words like horse, cow, pig, dog, cat, and their relations to each other. And uh, the point is being made here that the relations you have in uh, Spanish, where the Spanish word for horse, caballo, and the Spanish word for cow, vaca, are close to each other, and they're also close to each other in English, and so on. So these two spaces actually look really similar. Uh, so maybe all we need to do is some kind of uh, linear transform to get there. So that's uh, often what's used in, in mapping these language spaces is really just uh, one matrix multiplication. Okay, so how do you train this? Well, if you have a seed lexicon of word translations, you can check your current mapping between them. How well does it map the projection of the Spanish word across the matrix? Uh, how well does that map the English word that it's uh, that it's translational equivalent. Um, that's kind of the basic method. Um, there's a couple of things that, that make things a bit tricky. There's this so-called so hubness problem that some words have been nearest neighbors to many other words. So if you just kind of compute how similar words are, some words are just super similar to everything and some words are not super similar to everything. There's also ideas to do this without a seed lexicon using just monolingual data. So here's my cartoon version of that. Um, so if you have dog and cat that are similar to each other and lion, which is different in one language, and here you have katze and hund, which is cat and dog, uh, the hound in, in English, um, more similar to each other than lion. Well, so that should look, you would expect these triangles to exist. And you would also expect that, for instance, the, the link between lion and uh, cat in both languages is a bit shorter because they have some similarities. So you would talk about uh, maybe the whiskers of the lion and the cat and so on, on the cat pouncing and the lion pouncing where well, dogs don't really do they pounce, I don't know. Um, but the, obviously there's some more similarities between cat and lion. Okay, uh, so all you have to do is uh, figure out if that's the, the triangles in both these, these languages, there must be a way to kind of shift them over each other that they match perfectly. So that then automatically gives you the word alignments. Okay, there's also another way to do this called adversarial training. Um, I'm just going to give you like this as the last slide on mapping multilingual embedding spaces. We're going to revisit this when we talk about how to use monolingual data to train machine translation models. Okay, um, so there's an adversar adversarial training method that has been proposed. So um, if you just have the raw English and say English and German word embedding spaces, they don't map up. So um, the adversary can then figure out which ones are German and which ones are English. So it can basically detect which, are, uh, which ones are the English words, which ones are the German words. So this is the 
a discriminator in the adversarial training. So let's take a look how this works. So you have um, the discriminator who has to figure out that an English word is actually an English word so that you have the embedding for the English word. Can you figure out that that is actually an English word? While a German word that was projected through the matrix into the English space, can you figure out that that is actually a projected word? So this is actually originally a German word. So this is what the uh, adversary, the discriminator is trying to do. And uh, the training objective on the unsupervised learner is basically given the English word, um, can you fool the discriminator? Can you make it similar to other German words? Can you predict that this is German? And the same thing with the projected German word into English space. Can we make this as English as possible? Okay. Let's move on to another topic. The topic actually was originally motivated by complex morphology, but there's many reasons why we might have a large vocabulary. So um, first of all, we have Sif's law that tells us that words in a language are very unevenly distributed, unevenly distributed, and especially that you have a very large tail of rare words. So if you now look at words like retweeting, website, booked, lit, yeah, these are words that are probably a bit more common today, still not the most frequent words, but if you look at a large corpus that goes over back over a century, these are going to be super rare words. There's also things like names that are just, you know, pop up everywhere and new names are being invented. And that makes it also a very large pool of, of new vocabulary. So neural methods are not very well equipped to deal with such large vocabularies. So we want to have continuous space vectors and uh, these are discrete items. So basically this fostered this idea of how can we map these discrete items into things like word embeddings that are still highly dimensional, but the dimensionality is not as big as the vocabulary size. So uh, even if we do this, we need a large embedding matrix for input and output words. So um, at the input side, you have to deal with all these different input words coming in and the output words. It's even worse because you have to make a prediction over the entire output vocabulary and compute softmax over the entire output vocabulary. That is computationally quite expensive, both in terms of memory and speed. So one thing is to say, let's limit the vocabulary to maybe 20,000 to 80,000 words, and then map all the other words to the unknown word token, unk. So if you look at some machine translation papers, especially in the early days, there's a lot of obsession about what to do with unknowns and deal learning models for unknowns and do something with unknowns. So hopefully what the model will do is map an unknown token to an unknown token in the target language, and then you have to figure out some other method to kind of replace that unknown token with some kind of backup dictionary. They are, tend to be rare, so they're not that as, as important from a kind of pure quantitative point of view, but however, from a qualitative point of view, because they're rare, they actually carry quite significant meaning. Um, so another thing um, that can be done is uh, to do this, uh, maybe not in general, and that hasn't been done, but maybe we still want to do it for numbers and units. So when we have to translate 540,000 in English, which is written in English this way with like a comma in the middle, it, in Chinese it might be 54 and then a 10,000 symbol, and in India you might call it 5.4 luck. So learning this automatically might be a bit tricky because this kind of computation that has to happen here is uh, particular to every single number that occurs so maybe you want to do this more generic way that you just translate number tokens and then figure out how the numbers are expressed in different languages it gets even worse when you have to deal with things like 25 centimeters that has to be translated to 10 inches um, because different units are used in different uh, regions of the world. Okay, so uh, we already discussed uh, morphology as one 
of the causes for large vocabulary. So yes, we have tweet now suddenly as a very common word and we have tweets and we have someone tweeting and, and retweets and so on and so on. But we talked about this it follows fairly logical patterns. So all we have to do is do morphological analysis. Um, another thing is uh, compounding, homework, websites and the other languages like Finnish, Turkish, German and so on that do it even more excessively. So why don't we split them up? Um, oh, and what are we going to do with names? Um, so maybe just copy them in the output. However, that doesn't work if the output uses a different um, writing system. So if you have to translate these into Hindi script, or in the case of Netanyahu, into Hebrew script, um, actually, uh, you can't just copy it over. So you have to learn some model how to convert words, names, between writing systems. This is called transliteration. Okay, um, so breaking up words into subwords may be a good idea. So why don't we just, you know, these are all, all these have to comment and saying, well, we really want to break this up here. We really want to break this up here. We want to break this up here, here. We want to break this up here. We want to break this up here. And names, you maybe want to break up into individual letters and then convert them. So here's a method that was very influential and still being used in some variant uh, called byte pattern coding that does quite exactly that. It starts a little bit at the opposite end of the spectrum. It starts with breaking up words into characters. So you get then the sentence here where all the words are kind of separate in characters. So what we're trying to indicate here is that there's a space here. So T and then space H and then space and so on. So what do you do with space? Well, you have to you have to mark space then specifically as with a special space token. Uh, and then it merges frequent pairs. So this is then slowly evolving into reconstructing the words again. So in English, at least in this particular sentence, the sequence TH is the most frequent one. So your first merging rule is to combine a T and a H into that. Um, the next frequent one is the AT sequence, so that gets merged um, here and here. Um, then there is IN, which you have here um, and here. And, uh, and then you have THE, which happens here and here, that also gets merged. So this is kind of gets repeated over. If you do this for a while, uh, let's see what happens. So here's an example of what happens. Uh, this is using vocabulary of 50,000 words, trained over also kind of newsish kind of text. And you see actually most of the words get really put together again at the end to full words. Even names, because name like Obama is super frequent. Name like Netanyahu, uh, the prime minister of Israel, um, apparently is not as frequent in this corpus. So it still uh, is, appears broken up. Um, but also some uh, rarer word like destabilizing, criticizes, accuses, affront, impending, uh, strain, and so on. So some, some of these words are also broken up as well. So what we have now is subwords. Uh, so these are sometimes actually full words, sometimes they are partial words, but often their words are often broken up into just two or three parts. Um, it's completely data-driven, so it might reflect morphological patterns. So in our example before, critic and isis, so you have now the suffix isis to critic, that is a morphological, um, deri this derivational, mix of derivational and inflectional morphology. Impending is a nice suffix that gets separated out. But other things like affront are not really morphologically motivated. And also, obviously, for names, it's, it, there's no morphological reason for exactly this segmentation. OK, uh, it's still similar to what a lot of people do in unsupervised morphology. So there's also a long tradition of automatically deriving morphology from data. Um, just want to say one more thing. There is another uh, another variant of byte pen calling called sentence piece um, that 
operates very similar. Um, it has a different annotation. So here the spaces are marked with um, uh, this extra, extra space symbol here. So if you think about this uh, representation here to convert that into regular text is to remove all the spaces that are marked as actual spaces and then convert all these special space symbols into spaces afterwards. Um, this is how it would look like here. It's also different that the way um, the distinction is made between subwords that need to be merged and subwords that aren't merged is um, uh, this space symbol that's leading a word indicates this is the start of a new word. This actually has a bit more motivation where you actually see words like critic that can be occurring now as part of an inflectional version or just as a word by itself, which was not the case with the previous thing. Also, this only really works for uh, suffix morphology. So here you see prefix morphology. So you have pending, which is going to be different than pending as a word by itself, which would have the space marker. Okay, um, so the final thing we want to look at is character-based models. So since words are somewhat controversial linguistic concepts, why don't we just do away with them and saying we can all agree that human language is a sequence of characters, or at least human written language is a sequence of characters. So uh, why don't we represent words by the character sequence? So this, the, um, our standard method that we had so far, especially for frequent words, was we look at the distributional properties of beautiful in the data, and that gives us the embedding for beautiful. And now the idea is we're going to look at this characteristic sequence, and uh, we basically have to figure out um, can we also get a similar representation for beautiful. So basically the task here is if we have um, this kind of embedding space, can we learn the mapping from the character sequence to the word embedding that we computed earlier? And the hope is that this method then also kind of automatically learns things like inflection in morphology, where adding the word li at the end uh, gives you uh, also a very clear clue what that word means. And hopefully this method of learning what the li, what li adding to a word does to a word is then uh, general enough and can also be applied to new words. So the hope is that this learns morphological principles from basically raw character sequences. We could also do it another way. Instead of actually trying things back into words, we can now also present the entire training corpus as sequences over characters. So what we're going to have is character sequence models that take sequences of characters as input and produce sequences of characters as output without ever worrying what words are and what words where words start and stop. So the input to that is a uh, single character sequence as, as the tokens, input tokens, and including a special space symbol, and uh, the output is the same. However, this is generally poor performance, although this is still an open research question how well that might work. Okay, so the, a better approach, at least at the moment, seems to be that you have character-based word models. So the machine translation model is still at the heart operates on words, but then you also have uh, words being either formed by uh, word embeddings by themselves or by word embeddings based on character sequence. So, uh, so a typical solution today is to interpolate traditional word embeddings for words that are frequent or for all words with uh, word embeddings based on character sequence. Here is one way you could build uh, a mapping from character sequences here at the bottom to uh, character to word embeddings. So the input is uh, characters. So W O R D S, 
so it says here character or character trigams. So another idea is actually to not put it in as an input, the word, the letter W, for instance, but also always the left and the right uh, character. So the input could be uh, here, beginning of word W O, and here it would be O W O R, and here it would be O R D, and so on. So you always take the two neighboring uh, characters as well, because they might help with disambiguation. You're definitely not going to run into problems with dimensionality here because there are only 26 characters. Okay, uh, so what the model here is a recurrent neural network. This is really the same architecture as uh, the recurrent networks we encountered when we started out with language modeling and then moved to our first neural machine translation model. Um, so the endpoints of the left to right and right to left recurrent neural network are then taken as the states that they represent the entire word. And uh, that is then the, the representation um, that then gets mapped into uh, the space of word embeddings. Here's another architecture that seems to be more successful, which is convolutional neural networks that looks at uh, uh, yeah, two words in sequence, three words in sequence, four words in sequence, five words in sequence, and you kind of see how that uh, breaks out. So for instance, in this example, the first, uh, uh, st first uh, CNN state is composed of the first two characters. The second state would be composed of the second and third character, so all that is overlapping as well. Or to give you another example, um, here the, the state that is composed of four characters, this particular one is composed of these four characters here. Um, so each of these, uh, uh, for each of the uh, size of the n-grams, over characters that we compute states over, um, we then opt, uh, we then pick, uh, we unify them into max pooling, by max pooling into a single vector, and then you have at this point uh, the uh, four single vectors that then get fed into a feedforward neural network. So that's always four vectors here get fed into feedforward network to then predict. The word embedding. Okay, and that's how much we take it today. So we took a closer look at Word. I think the main practical things that uh, are being used today definitely are uh, bytecode, uh, byte pan coding. So you should be familiar with that process. And uh, then we looked at various character-based models, which are still an open research frontier, arguably. They are a bit more principled than byte pair sequences, which seem to be rather arbitrary in their uh, segmentation granularity. And it's one strange hyperparameter you have to set. And you always have inconsistency with different corpora. However, character-based models are um, currently definitely more complicated to deal with. So they haven't really taken over, but who knows what happens in the next years. Okay, and that's it for today, and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture.